Well, howdy. Uh, this is my first time over here to Hemphill. I'm very excited to be with you guys. I uh, started in January, um, so I've been around a little bit longer than Jason, but not terribly much longer. Uh, glad to be with y'all, and um, we'll go ahead and get started. If y'all have any questions, feel free to stop me during the presentation. I, I don't mind um, taking questions during. So we'll go ahead and get started. So we've heard a lot about nutrition today, and um, what, what's the point of all of this nutrition information that we're getting? What is the overall goal that we're trying to achieve here? We're trying to make money. Yes, that's our ultimate goal. So these guys have been talking to you about the micro and about what you can do on your own operation in order to try and increase your profitability through nutrition. What I'm here to do is not only talk to you a little bit about um, maybe the micro eventually, but today we're gonna focus a lot on the macro and how you can adapt maybe some of what you're doing in the near future to um, focus on that macro uh, economy and sort of look at when is a better time for you to hold on, when is a better time for you to sell. Uh, we're gonna look at some of those strategic things here towards the end of the presentation. But if you have any questions, like I said, just feel free to stop me and we'll go ahead and dive on in. So brief outline of where we're going today. We're gonna talk about the overall macro economy, where we're going, uh, sort of the general trends that we're seeing. I'm sure everyone has heard in the news recently about some of the caution, some of maybe the negative outlook for our uh, economic forecast in the near future. We're gonna talk about that and why you might potentially need to look forward with a little bit more optimism than you might hear in the news. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Holcomb fire. I'm sure that's been very forward in everyone's mind. We're only about two hours, maybe three hours from Holcomb here. So I'm sure we've seen a little bit of market impact in this area. We'll do a brief outlook and then talk about how African swine fever is actually impacting our overall cattle market or how it could impact it in the future because surprisingly that African swine fever could have an impact on our beef markets here in the United States. So we'll dive in with this general economic outlook. What we've got here is a chart of uh, overall global economic growth. We're starting in 1980 and moving on into a forecast up to 2024. What we have here on the left axis is the uh, percentage growth or percentage change year over year. And then what you see here are different measures of different types of countries. Green is our overall world economic growth. Red is emerging markets. So when we talk about emerging markets, we're talking about what we call the BRIC countries. Brazil, Russia, India, and China, BRIC. We also include some Southeastern Asian countries in here. So uh, maybe the Philippines, growing economies that are where we're seeing not only uh, sustained consumer activity, but maybe an increase in consumer activity and production because those economies are advancing at a much faster pace on average than what ours we would normally think is advancing, just because they are a little bit behind us in terms of development. Advanced economies, that's the United States. That's our partner countries that, in general, we think of as partners with the US. So the G7 that you hear about all the time, a lot of those are what we consider our advanced economies. You can see here GDP plummeted. Just to give you a reference point, that is right where the uh, recession of 2008 hit us. So that gives you sort of an idea of where we were. You can see we had some moderating influences here in the advanced economy, so a lot of this is weighted on the US. We had an increase following the uh, 2016 election, and now we're seeing moderating influences going forward. What's moderating all of that? What's sort of leading to our uh, maybe lower economic growth year over year? Keep in mind, this does not mean that we're talking about a recession. We're talking about a slowdown in growth. You can see we stay above zero in forecast. So we're not looking at a recession, we're looking at a slowdown in growth, which are, they are not the same thing. Why are we seeing this? There are several influences that are leading us to these forecasts, and those are trade disputes globally. It's not just the United States. There are a lot of countries that are incurred, uh, that are included, ooh, excuse me, a lot of countries that are involved in trade disputes at the moment, and that's causing uncertainty. When we have uncertainty, we typically see a lower forecast for economic growth because we don't know where we will be in the near future, which makes it harder for people to invest with confidence, and not only for private citizens to invest, but for businesses and companies to invest. So that moderates our overall growth outlook. We're also seeing at the, we're at the end of an expansion cycle. There is a typical business cycle that we see in any sort of market. You know about the cattle cycle where we see growth, a peak, and eventually a trough. We have business cycles that function much the same way, and we're at the end of this expansionary cycle in the United States and the United States economy serves as an indicator for the rest of the global economy. So a lot of that is kind of what's driving 
uh, what we're seeing right here uh, as far as our forecast. Why does this matter for us? We all function in this global economy. Now, if we were at a cotton meeting, this would be much more important because cotton goes into durable goods when we're talking about um, you know, sofa cushions and clothes, and those are the first things that people stop buying whenever they, um, whenever we see a slowdown in global economic growth. Because if we're uncertain of where our future is going to be in the next year, or what our economic situation is going to be like in the next year, we're going to be less likely to buy those durable goods, which again, cotton is very involved in. Um, why it matters for beef and why it matters for livestock is that the higher that economic growth is, especially in these red countries, these uh, growing emerging market countries, the higher and faster that, that is growing, the faster we see consumption of meats. So when people's income uh, grows, they typically switch over from a plant-based diet to more of a, a protein-based diet. And so we want that red line especially to continue increasing because that's where we'll see a lot more of the expansion in demand for beef in the future. Any questions on that? So uh, again, we're talking about a, a moderating overall economic growth in the near future. And this is one of the indicators. How many people have heard about yield curve inversion? Raise your hand. Who knows what it means? There we go. That's, that's excellent. So this is a chart of what we're talking about right here. I wish I had a door prize. I don't. Uh, so what we're talking about, this is our 10-year treasury interest rate against our three-month treasury interest rate. When we see it above the black line, that is a normal uh, economic situation. It's when you are getting more interest or a higher yield on your overall uh, uh, money that you've loaned to the government or to a company through a bond. You're getting more money in the long term because they're <coughs> tying up your money for a longer period. When those switch and in the short term, that, that um, overall outlook has switched, this line goes below zero, which means we've had an inversion of the yield curve. So the yield curve is a chart of what those interest rates are between short-term and long-term bonds. That's all it is. What you can see here where I've circled in red, we see that yield curve invert, or we see a negative. These gray boxes then on the same chart, those signal recession. That's where we've seen a, a global recession or a US recession. Now this is not a one-to-one -one relationship. This does not mean that we are going to have a recession. But because just because the recession was followed an inversion, that does not always happen. Now, an inversion always precedes a recession. A recession does not always follow an inversion, if that makes sense. So just because we're seeing now an inversion here in the last few months does not mean that we are headed for a recession. It's another one of those cautionary indicators where we're saying, all right, along with the trade outlook, along with the fact that we're at the end of an expansion cycle, we might have a cautious economic outlook in the near term because we've got several indicators that are pointing that way. And again, this is not always an indicator of recession, but maybe a moderator of our economic outlook in the near future. This is the same thing we were talking about earlier. It's just kind of blown up to where we're seeing 2014 to the present instead of 85 to the present. And you can see here again a brief inversion. And those things change from day to day. These, these interest rates are determined on an actual market. So if there's a higher demand for one one day, the yield curve might invert in the middle of the day and be back to normal by the end of the day. But the fact that we're oscillating back and forth means that we are heading for a normal inversion. So that's kind of our economic outlook for the near term, maybe expecting some moderated economic growth in the near future, heading out of an expansion. Does anybody have any questions before we move on? Excellent. All right, we're going to talk about the Holcomb fire next. So this happened on August 9th. A fire in the Holcomb, Kansas Tyson plant uh, took out about half of the overall plant. So I've seen reports recently that are saying that the process, the further process section of the plant is still up and running. So they're shipping in meat from other uh, plants and further processing it. But the actual kill floor is down. So that's what's led us to some of these really major market impacts that we haven't seen in a while. We were limit down two days in a row, which hasn't happened in a very long time. And it takes a major fundamental force to change those things. So that plant was responsible for approximately 6% of our overall fed steer slaughter. And the price for feeders and fats were limit down that following day and the day after that. But as recently we saw that there are reports that will be open in January, maybe December. Uh, Tyson representatives said that their Q1 begins in December. 
And so they're trying to get back up and running by Q1, and the damage was not as much as they originally estimated. But, I mean, if anyone's ever done a renovation on their house, it may take longer than they project. I'm not really sure. But they're saying December or January. Now, how many people have seen that this was a stunt pulled uh, in some sort of nefarious action and that all of this was price fixation? Has anybody seen that reported? Okay. Everybody's guessed it. People have guessed it? Absolutely. So I'm going to walk through with you now why what happened when we saw beef prices rise and cattle prices decline. I'm gonna walk through with you why that would, that is the economic activity we would expect. Now, I'm not, I have not measured the magnitude. I'm not saying that any of this may not have been an advantageous situation for the beef company to take care of or to take advantage of. I'm not saying that. I'm just telling you, we're gonna go through why the direction movement we saw is what we would expect. Our, yes, so our actual, um, but, but it's not, but that's, does, that's not what drives price. The number killed. I understand that, yeah. but there's uh, the whole scare, oh, we're mm -hmm. not going to be able to supply beef and those markets will crash, and then at the end of the month, we build more, more cattle than we do yeah. the month before that, the assumption of the other plants to take advantage of the prices? Yeah, well, so it's, it's a, it's, it's, you know. so it's a, Again, we're going to go through this, but what it is is we have more people that are demanding beef at that point in time, and they're scared that they're not going to be able to have access to the beef when they need it. And those reports, when those numbers come out, are two weeks behind. So the perception was that we were going to be out of 6% of our capacity. And I'll walk through that. Yeah, absolutely. So those other, but those other Tyson plants are going to readjust for the same capacity they have. So they'll slaughter on Saturdays. But they didn't increase the overall volume that's available. They might have picked up more on Saturdays. But I'm going to walk through why this is the directional movement that we would expect. So again, here's where we are. This is that two-day limit down that we saw. Right now this morning when I looked, we were at 129. This is for our uh, October feeders. So we're going to talk about beef. Now, we have to see beef and cattle as two totally separate markets. And one of the things that we have uh, run into is that people are viewing these as the same market. And I'm just going to show how, if we view them as different markets, this is the economic direction we would expect these prices to move. So we temporarily lost 6% of our beef supply. In theory, that is what the market saw. Whether that was true or not, <laughs> The people who are buying beef and are not acquainted with agriculture, who are purchasers and buyers for Walmarts and big buyers of beef, they saw the perception that we were going to lose 6% of our overall supply. That's what led to the sudden, very rapid rundown in the cattle prices. I'll explain that on the next slide. But that's what led to the run up in beef price. So when we see demand remain constant, which it did, and a perception that supply is going to contract, we see an increase in price. So that's what's led to our overall increase in the price of beef. Because demand remained equal, but we thought, or people buying beef thought the supply was going to contract. So more and more people were trying to buy beef ahead of the perceived shortage, and they were willing to pay a higher price for that beef to make sure they had what they needed. And you can see right here, that's where we saw this spike in boxed beef cutout value. And the magnitude of this is substantial compared to the magnitude in the decline in cattle price that we saw. Again, I'm not speaking to magnitude. I'm just talking about directional change. There might have been some people taking advantage of this, but a lot of it is uh, driven by we have a lot of people that are buyers of beef and not as many people who are buyers of cattle. So it's different in the price relationship. Now here, what we have is our cattle market, demand for cattle temporarily decreased by 6% in theory. So the market perception of those people who are uh, buying, or the, so if we're talking about people in New York who are buying cattle contracts and they are just working in the market, they're not necessarily engaged in agriculture, their sudden perception was that the demand for cattle would suddenly decrease by 6%. And we see a decline in demand of 6% with supply remaining constant, we do expect that price to decline. And that's where we see here the decrease in our slaughter steer price and the decrease in our feeder steer prices. Again, the magnitude is not as high, 
And that's because of the difference in the number of people buying each product. And these are in different markets. So this is not necessarily a function of what happened, but what people perceived was going to happen. And by the time we get numbers out, so this plant fire happened on Friday. We didn't get slaughter for that week until a week later. And we didn't get slaughter for the week after the fire until almost two weeks later. So the perception of what was going on in the market was allowed to linger for a full two weeks before we got actual information out into the marketplace where buyers were able to understand what was going on. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. So that's what we got on the Holcomb fire. Again, directional change is what we would expect. Magnitude is something that is up for discussion whether or not there was any, any price fixing or any people trying to take advantage of that situation. Before you leave the open fire, then, mm -hmm. uh, what would you expect to be the next reaction in the market? So the, we'll, we'll get to that in the outlook, but what's difficult about the Holcomb fire is that we had a fundamental structural change in the market. And again, a lot of this pricing is driven by people who are not involved in agriculture. They're just uh, market analysts. So until we see some sort of fundamental change, a trade agreement, uh, some sort of USDA report that shows a change in yields on corn or a change in yields on some of our other feedstuffs, I'm not seeing any sort of signal that's going to make us jump back up and go into an island reversal on, on the overall futures price. And the futures eventually, at some point, are connected to our local pricing. So, so when they get the home plant back going, they'll see it. Now, so that, that would be a structural change. That would be a structural change. That would be a structural change. change. But is that December, is that January? Does something else happen between now and then? I would wonder if we don't have some sort of structural change before then. But if I understand the scare and how it crashed, mm -hmm. you know, and you would expect that when they had their yield numbers were basically the same, mm -hmm. you know, and they could blow the tail, you know, which it did, it started to up. Why did it go back to trade? So what we're seeing now is that if there was any purchasing, or if we've got people who are not, uh, that we're still reorganizing and realigning because not all of the cattle are going to their normal destinations out of the feedlots. And so my understanding and what I have read is that we are waiting on that reorganization to iron itself out. Um, what that means is that if we've got feeders, feeders have an incentive to keep their marketings and their placements in line with each other. So they're showing caution in taking on more cattle because they have an incentive to make sure they're getting cattle out of the yard into the processing plants before they start filling back up. So my understanding is that we still have a now a glut of feeder calves because we're not exactly sure where all of our uh, fats are going to end up going because that is not all completely ironed out yet. If I had one more, I really wish I had one more week of data because if I had one more week of data available, I think we're going to start seeing a moderating influence in overall um, location and where it's going. But that would also mean I'm not exactly sure why prices aren't rising. So we're still stuck pretty low compared to where we should be against the index. And we'll talk about that in the outlook. So you think there's a buildup of feeder cattle <coughs> Again, a perception. Yeah, a, a perception of... I, I have not looked at that data. We don't have a cattle on feed report that incorporates the Holcomb fire yet. Um, so I can't speak to that specifically, but I would think that the, <coughs> they have an incentive to move their cattle through at a steady pace. And if we have not organized exactly to where this next three months we're going to send our cattle all the time, there might be a slowdown in overall placements. Yes. Because again, if you've got fewer buyers, so our processors are the smallest segment in the beef industry. And if they are not offering the prices that the feeders are looking for, and they are holding their cattle to larger sizes, then their yards are still full. And the smaller the market, so the smaller section, such as our packers, they have more price control power than the number of feedlots, because we've got a larger number of feedlots. So they're holding on to the market power right now, the packers are. But we don't have a cattle on feed report that confirms that. <coughs> Nearly the entire West ships their calves off the pasture in October, from September to October. Would not, not have a determining factor on what, what a feeder calves are going to bring? So if you've got another big storm of calves coming in, if we see demand remaining constant, 
and supply growing, we should expect a decline in price. And again, I think as you're saying, we typically see September, October, and early November as a weak time for prices. And I, I don't expect that to change. And I don't expect that to make the price outlook more positive in the near future. Well, I would have thought that would have had more of an effect than you know the plant burning or that and the the trade the trade disagreements that we're having and the influx of cattle coming in in October. And it, it will have an impact, but it's going to have that impact of probably driving prices because everyone's sending their calves in. Like you said, the entire West is sending their calves in at the same time, so we suddenly have an increase in supply with again relatively stable demand. So that's when we typically see a a softening in prices seasonally. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> All right, so now we'll talk about African swine fever. I mixed up my, uh, my overall uh, map of how we're gonna go through this presentation, but we're gonna talk about African swine fever and how that might have an impact on our uh, local beef economy. So what is African swine fever? Um, I'm sure everyone's heard about this by now. This is not a uh, food-borne illness. This is not a food safety issue. This is what we call a disease of economics. It's because it has a 100% death rate whenever it's entered into a, a swine herd. Um, in theory, it has a 100% death rate. We're, I'm not really sure if that's the case or not because they call any herd that has any sort of indication of infest or infection with ASF. So um, it's a highly contagious disease um, that is affecting both domestic and wild pigs. Um, and there's no treatment or vaccine available. Again, as I said, the only way to get rid of it is to depopulate. And where we've seen this really become a factor is in China. China has a huge hog herd, or they did before the outbreak of ASF, and that's where we're gonna see it impact the United States overall. So this is a map of active outbreaks or countries that have active outbreaks. And this orange one is that we see in the last year, there's been the first reported outbreak. So through Africa, this is Mongolia, you can see China, <coughs> Russia, it's moving all the way into Europe. So what that means for us is that we are exporting a lot more pork, even under our 65 or higher percent um, tariff rate that we have currently, uh, retaliatory tariff from China, we are exporting a lot of pork. Um, you can see we're above the five-year index, that red line, we're above last year's export value by a lot, and that's even considering, as I said, those overall tariffs. Right here is where we saw the first major reports on African swine fever start breaking out, and we saw a massive run up in the price of pigs because we thought there was going to be an extreme shortage. Now there is an extreme shortage, but it's being mod those price impacts are being moderated by the tariffs. So if we didn't have any tariff, retaliatory tariffs in place by China, we would see this number be substantially higher because people would be willing to purchase a lot more hogs. And that's where we're seeing this slow decline is that moderating influence of the tariffs. Another thing we're seeing is that um, whenever they depopulate these herds, as I said, it's not a food safety issue, so whenever China depopulated thousands, if not millions of hogs, they suddenly had a massive glut of pork in cold storage that they were able to purchase and cycle through their production sector. So everyone got really excited and thought we were gonna have a huge demand for pork, but those tariffs and the overall um, glut of pork we had in cold storage ended up slowing down and dropping our price back down to the lower end. Now, um, the current pork situation is that uh, those supplies are growing and margins are slimming. We had a massive uptick in the number of pigs per litter this year and the number of overall breedings grew in our hogs report a couple of months ago. And so what that means is that we're gonna have, again, an increase in supply, but if we can have some sort of trade negotiation action with China, we could expect to see our demand increase and start sending those prices higher. The uncertainty with China is still that major factor and um, we continue to see very little action in those markets. Now, why does this matter to us in cattle country? Pork and beef are substitute goods, so that means that when the price of one rises, we typically will see the price of another rise. And that happens because if the price of pork rises and we see people moving away from pork consumption because of the increasing price and they're moving into eating more beef, the demand for the higher demand for beef with the same supply means that we'll see an increase in price overall, going back to those fundamental charts I showed earlier. So 
if we were able to see any sort of tariff action and see a lot more of our pork going to China, we would see an increase in the price of pork. And as a result, we would see some movement in the overall price of beef and as a result, eventually down the increase in the price of cattle. This is not only important for our overall pricing, but also for the fact that biosecurity in the livestock industry is very important. It's becoming a, not only a hot topic, but a very important topic, topic globally. And here in the United States, I constantly hear people discussing whether or not um, we, are putting in to, we are putting in enough uh, safeguards to keep things like African swine fever out. And it's a disease, again, of economics, not only of, um, uh, it's not really a zoonotic disease we have to worry about getting in to the human food supply. But any negative perception on the meat industry, even if it's against pork, could negatively, negatively impact the overall meat industry. So this is why it matters in cattle country. A lot of it is this pricing movement. If we could see a sudden demand increase for pork uh, from a tariff negotiation resolution with China, then we would have quite a bit of, uh, I think, positive movement in pork price and as a result, beef price. And also, this overall biosecurity and our high plains pork production. Let me ask you something. The result of that is they actually slaughtered and processed the pigs, that were, the herds that were liquidated? Yes, that's the, that's the result we saw in China and right. Vietnam as well. All right, so there, that, that pork is in storage somewhere and it was to be consumed by people? Yes. Okay. And the result that could be beneficial for our overall meat market in the long term is that ASF is nearly impossible to get rid of. It will live in the soil. It will live long term uh, without any sort of eradication procedure that we know of thus far. So if they are no longer able to produce pork in China at the rate they were accustomed to, we might see an increase in our demand for pork overall like for a long term situation. And that's not only China, that's Vietnam, uh, Eastern Europe, and again, in substitute goods, a rising tide lifts all boats. And so we would expect that if there's price strength in pork, here in the United States, more people are gonna move away from pork and relatively towards beef and chicken. And so it would be beneficial for us long-term to resolve this overall trade dispute with China that could send us back some demand strength in pork. Who is supplying the additional pork to China that we're losing out on? So right now they're in a glut. They're still moving through that overall cold storage that they have. They're running low, and I'm not sure, but we're exporting a lot of our own pork to China. So this is U.S. exports to China. Sorry, that's not the world. This is our U.S. exports to China, even with that tariff in place. So we're ship, we shipped in June 70 million pounds of pork to China. So, so we, we really don't know the effect that the tariffs have on it until that runs out? Or? Right, yeah. If we if the tariffs were eliminated, we would assume that this would be much higher. We would assume we'd be exporting a lot more pork to China. So, but they, the reason we're not moving it, we're not sending it to them now is because of the, the supply they currently have, correct? The supply they currently have and our tariffs. So, if our tariffs are hurting ours, they're getting pork from somewhere else? Or are they just not eating as they're much? They're just not eating as much. Okay. We're, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. They're not eating as much and we're seeing uh, anecdotal reports. The difficult part with this problem is that we're not always sure that we know that the information we're getting from the Chinese government is accurate. We've heard reports. It's true. <laughs> and now I'm on video saying that. It's perfect. Uh, but it's, it's true. I mean, you can see all the way through the Food and, the food and Animal Organization of the United States or of, of the world is saying that we've got anywhere from 3 million to 30 million hogs that have been depopulated in China. That's a big difference. Um, 27 million. 27? Just, well, just 27 million between three and three. Right. Yeah. So we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of reports, and, and the difficult part is we just aren't sure exactly what the data is. So we can speak to relative situations and, and relative magnitudes, but speaking to exact numbers is very difficult at this point. Any other questions? I know it's Now I've got eight whole slides hidden at the back of this on fake protein. Um, and we can discuss that if y'all are interested at the end. Um, my long-term outlook is that our consumers are price sensitive. We as economists believe that people are price sensitive. And right now the cheapest 
forecast for a pound of ground beef um, or ground fake beef is going to be eight dollars a pound when you're seeing about a 350 from at the federal level what they've measured is about 350 for a pound of regular beef that you would get at the store and we believe that consumers are price sensitive and so we would assume that the demand for that product is not going to outweigh the influence that price has on consumers I think there is a niche market for that that's available I do not think we're going to see I, I'm, again I'm on tape saying this so this is perfect um, I do not think we're gonna see the 45 percent of the industry take over that those meat companies those fake meat companies are forecasting they have an incentive for their shareholders to pump those numbers up to continue bringing in capital so they've got an incentive to increase those forecasts but I do not think that with a price point that high we're gonna see people switch over because people like the product that you're all producing we've been eating beef very happily for hundreds of years and I don't think that that price is going to be competitive I'm off my soapbox now any other questions? Well, have you heard that uh, Carville uh, up in Illinois is starting to build a protein plant, $27 million investment? I had not heard that. I know that several of the larger processing companies are rebranding as protein companies rather than a, uh, a meat processing company, but still mo the majority of their portfolio is traditional, uh, what we'd consider traditional meat. If it'll grind soybeans, I bet it'll grind hamburger beef when it don't work out. Any other questions? All right, we'll move on really briefly to the outlook. I think I have no idea what my time limit is. I'm glad y'all are still awake. After that uh, barbecue and cobbler, I'm surprised I'm awake myself. All right, so brief outlook. I like to look at the supply side and the demand side whenever I'm looking at the overall uh, market outlook because I really prefer to just stick with the fundamentals. So what we've got here is production overall. We've got about 20, this is about 27 billion pounds of beef produced. This was a projection for 2019. Now we won't know this until 2020 whether or not we met this target, but these are typically pretty accurate. They're coming out of uh, LMIC and the USDA and these projections are typically pretty close so we're expecting 27 billion pounds of beef produced and around 105 billion pounds of overall meat in the US produced so we've got beef in blue uh, pork in that second green band you can barely see a little bit of red here that's lamb and veal chicken is this light blue and then this second green band is that turkey production so you can see we've had a steady increase in meat production over the last few years a lot of that's being driven by exports and people's increased desire for a meat product. And that's going back to um, the uh, fake protein I was talking about. People have been happy to consume meat for the last few years. So again, we're going to be talking about the economics and the price points of people going over to those other protein sources. But that's our overall production, which we're going to call supply. Now we've got our overall consumption, which is our demand. You can see we've got beef sitting here steady at about 55, uh, 52 pounds eaten annually per capita. So this is overall consumption by a single person each year. We're sitting at about uh, 219 pounds. Sorry, that's 58 pounds of beef eaten per person per year on average. And um, 219 pounds of total meat eaten annually. So if you figure we've got 327 million people in the United States eating about 58 pounds of beef, that puts us at a total of around 19 billion pounds um, consumed. So right in this neighborhood which means the rest of that, eight billion pounds, exports are very important because we need somewhere to send that beef. So any movement we can have in trade agreements uh, in a positive fashion is very important because we wanna open that market access to China, we wanna open that market access to Japan, and we wanna continue that strong relationship we have with Mexico that we send a lot of our byproducts and a lot of our cheaper cuts to. So now we're getting more into the cattle side, cow-calf returns. Um, the projection for 2019 is negative. This chart was uh, constructed when corn price was much closer to $5. So I would expect that this red band is going to be uh, much closer to zero uh, instead of a negative return, probably closer to uh, a net washout. But returns you'll see here for 2020 are projected <coughs> to increase and be positive. We'll talk about why that is on the next couple of slides. Um, We've got, again, our overall feeder steer prices that are low. 
When you start seeing these low prices like we've got right now, this is part of what's going to lead us possibly to these higher returns in the near future. If we've got people that are liquidating herds because of low calf prices, feeder steers, uh, calves, if they're liquidating um, their cows because they are unable to get a premium for their calves, we're eventually going to start seeing that turnaround in the cattle cycle. This Holcomb fire might have, might have contributed to that eventual turnaround. I talked about the cattle cycle earlier. We were already reaching the peak in a smooth out, a very slow flattening out of the peak of the cattle market. And now that prices are declining for calves and feeders, there's less incentive for everyone to hold on to their cows long term because they're not able to make that return to pay for those cows. So if we, this year we've already seen a lot more heifers and a lot more cows in the production line as a percentage. And so that is a signal that we are heading into a turnaround, which would mean a smaller cow herd and potentially higher calf prices. So going forward, what we're looking for, uh, what we talked about early in the year, what was driving a lot of that low value for cull cows was what was happening in the dairy market. Milk prices collapsed. We weren't getting a lot for milk. And so a lot of those dairy cows were moving into the cull cow market. And again, constant demand with an increase in supply is going to lead us to lower prices. So that's a big reason we saw a low value for our cull cows early in the year. But dairy uh, milk prices are moving back up, and a lot of this is being smoothed out. We're not seeing as many dairy cows that are entering the cull cow market. So our cull cow value should be on the way up in the near future. Excuse me. Now what's going to be driving our decision is that quality of grass. And we'll talk about briefly what the grass outlook is here in Hemp Hill here in just a second. I've got a map. Um, but overall, for the very near future, in the next four to six months, maybe four, four months is kind of what these are indexed to, we're looking at lower calf prices in the near term. And a lot of that, again, we're looking for a fundamental signal that's going to drive our speculators and our people that are not involved in ag but investing is going to drive them back into purchasing more of our feeder contracts and our live contracts so they can start pulling that price up. Um, and that fundamental signal may be the overall increase in the, uh, or decrease in the cow herd that is driving us to a lower supply of animals. So again, the decision variable for us right now is whether or not we have the quality of grass to overwinter our cows and wait on a potential premium in the near future. So this is the drought monitor for June 4th. As you can see, most of the state was in either very low drought status or no drought status at all. In three months, we've moved to a work where around 97% of the state is in some form, some form or another of drought. But right here, where we're sitting, we're in 0%. So I don't know. I'm right, I'm right here in Swisher County, so I guess I need to start going to both Sunday services or something because we're not getting... Uh, the same sort of precipitation that y'all are all getting. Um, so is that, is that consistent with what y'all are seeing? This is a federally set drought index. Are, are we seeing, I mean, does anyone see something different where they're at? Y'all are getting an adequate amount of rain comparatively? I think, I think the micro, there's, there's areas, I don't, I don't think it's a widespread thing. I think it's an average that we're seeing in that, in that particular area. Yeah. And I would imagine it's coming creeping, right? So we're seeing right here along the border, it's starting to creep in. But for now, this was the map from last week. Um, compared to the rest of the state, relatively uh, good forage availability. And feed prices are low, which is important as well. So what, we're gonna, what, we, what we would foresee and what we would suggest is that if you have the grass to winter cows, this applies to stalkers as well, there might be an opportunity to get a premium after everyone else who had to get rid of their animals for, non, for inadequate forage. Um, after they've all gone through, there's going to be a turnaround and there will be the possibility of a premium for cow and uh, stalker prices. So that's kind of what we're looking at for the early spring. Factors that could send us lower are continued pressure from the Holcomb plant um, or lack of significant trade deals. I imagine we'll see this pressure from the Holcomb plant iron out very soon, but again, if we're stuck in this low band of prices, we're going to need some sort of fundamental signal to send us out of that low band and back up into some sort of higher value for our feeder steers. Um, upward price pressure, we're going to, we saw a smaller calf crop this year and the forecast is for an even smaller calf crop next year than we have this year. 
And that's because, again, we had a higher percentage of heifers and steers going into uh, the processing sector. And so a fewer number of cows and heifers means that we're going to have a fewer number of calves and lower supply would lead us to expect a higher price. So overall, we expect that the annual average calf price in 2020 to be higher than it was in 19 and likely higher than it was in 18. Stockers, we're in a market with substantial uncertainty. A lot of this is gonna be driven um, by that feedlot incentive that I was talking about earlier. Um, once packers have ironed out where they're sending their cows, we could see that price start to climb back up. Um, but for the short term, without some structural change, I don't expect a lot of upward movement in our feeders. Uh, but if you have the forage to get through the winter with them or any sort of feed availability currently, there is the incentive or there is the opportunity for you to take advantage of a premium in the spring because of the fact that a lot of the people who are not able to graze out in all of this dry area, especially in this area that we're talking about right here and in this area, if you have the ability to winter your cattle with cheap forage, then there's the opportunity that you'll have some premiums available for you in the spring. Um, that's kind of what I've got for everyone. Or we can, I've got a couple of slides on the fake meat, but it's not really economics, it's more discussion based. But if anyone has any questions, um, I've got a blog where I talk about the different market forces every week. It's agrilife.org, Amarillo Ag Econ. You can contact me at any time at this number. <coughs> See me on Facebook or Twitter. I'd be happy to talk with you about any of this stuff or anything else you might have questions about.